Hello and welcome to the Indian Cultural Forum and News Click. Today we are joined by Seba Hossain, whose book on Kashmir has recently come out titled Love, Loss and Longing in Kashmir. The book documents years of Seba's uh, research and fieldwork in Kashmir as well as our experiences with the people of the state. So thank you Seba for joining us Thanks, today. Thanks Surangya. Thanks for inviting me for this. Yeah. So in your uh, book, in many places, you talk about, you recollect people's memories of the worst years of the insurgency and you also write about the kind of trauma it inflicts on people to witness uh, killings and enforced disappearances firsthand of their loved ones. And in the introduction, you write about the Pledge of the Aggrieved, which is that the uh, people, that is the Kashmiri people, will not forget or forgive the history of violence and that the battle is for justice and accountability. And then we come to the situation today, particularly after the events of August mm. 5 and the imposition of the lockdown. And people are saying that things right now are in fact much worse than they were before. So, we're, and, and the government is saying that these things, these events are eventually to bring a sense of normalcy in Kashmir. So what do you think can be the result of all of this? Actually, it is very difficult for me to say what the result would be. But when I wrote in the introduction, about the pledge of the aggrieved, because when you see firsthand, you know, 30 years now almost of mm. the insurgency and the kind of mass violence and uh, how people have coped with it, you know, and it is really a matter of survival. When we talk about trauma, we also talk about intergenerational, you know, now it's three generations. Yeah. So the pledge of the aggrieved never to forget is I think very important in this because you have to remember the history of violence because children have grown up, those who were five or 10 are now in their thirties, more. And hmm. now I see small children who are filling the gaps when their mothers or their grandmother, they are quiet because they are weeping and the children give you the details because this is what they've witnessed and this is what they have seen. So I think that memory, hmm. it's not just a memory as much as an everyday experience of mass violence where the entire family gets pulled in. You know, numbers can only tell you one part of the story, but it's only when you see people and their everyday experience and their narratives about what it actually means to sit, live in a very politicized, militarized, area that they do and it's unresolved. This kind of unresolved conflict, the violence, the trauma that is collective trauma, it, it's almost an entire population hmm. that is in its uh, grip. So it is not just, it doesn't just challenge India's democracy, it's a threat to India's democracy and the sooner we resolve it, the better. And regarding what happened post 5th August after the government uh, abrogated Article 370, it's made matters even worse, yeah. you see. So here we are talking about remembering what has happened to them. And now it is become even more terrible for the people who are living there because suddenly you are captive, suddenly your whole identity as a Kashmiri Muslim majority state Hmm. That was the only Muslim majority state and suddenly it's taken away from you and you are told now you are subjects under the central government, you are captive. I mean, unfortunately, since this book I wrote and the first draft, I haven't gone back to Kashmir and I had planned to go with this book. So the timing has been a bit strange and someday I definitely want to go back with my book and meet people and discussed. And also important to the sense of normalcy is the uh, sense of Kashmiriyat, which is very important to the Kashmiri people, the sense of Kashmiri identity. And important to the sense of Kashmiriyat is the syncretism that was there in Kashmir, was an essential part of the fabric of Kashmir, in which Kashmiri Pandits, Muslims, Sikhs, all other communities would exist peacefully with each other. So when the question of Kashmiri Pandits is brought up, the focus is on them leaving, but not on the reasons why they're not able to return today. So can you tell us about some of these reasons which you've also written about in your book, why they cannot return today? And now after the conditions, how the conditions are today, when would the return be possible? Actually, one of the reasons it is the first chapter in my book, and it is one of the most extensive chapters in my book, because 
when I began field work also, whoever you meet, wherever you go, their absence is felt hmm. in very material terms because you have these uh, houses that have been abandoned. Everyone talks about how they had to leave and the pundits who have stayed back. That is another area which actually has not received the kind of attention should have. it should have because they are the ones who have actually stayed back and faced the same similar yeah. reality and fate as the Kashmiri Muslims. Mm. And the whole idea for me to actually begin with this chapter also because my work was in Kashmir and I visited all the mohallas that had been you know, left bereft of the Kashmiri pundits because hmm. they had already 95% of the community. So this tragedy of the Kashmiri pundits having had to flee out of fear, out of insecurity, out of the reasons that were there, everybody knows about it, is something which is uh, a, a big tragedy. And I think we have to see it within the larger tragedy of what Kashmir is today. So their return, first we have to talk about 30 years it's going to be now. And when pundits left in a rush, you know, mm. from 1990, January, I mean, I've recounted in the book how they remember that night of grief and confusion where trucks and whole families, and when people wake up, whether they are Muslims or Kashmiri pundits, suddenly a whole mohalla is emptied of the whole community. So when we talk about their return, we have to first talk about are you creating the conditions for them to return? Hmm. What is the government policy, successive governments? When I talk about 30 years, it's not just today that it has happened, but they have never paid attention to what it would make for the pundits, what is possible to be done for the pundits to return in a normal course of time. As, now they are building, the government has built several, uh, you know, camps and houses, pakka houses mm. in Jammu. They have done it in Srinagar, segregated housing, which I visited, Shekhupura it is called, 200 mm. flats with BSF, CRPF posted outside, high walls, barbed wire. No Kashmiri Pandit would want to come and live like that. Why are you creating segregated pockets of residence for Kashmiri Pandits when they themselves do not want. What they want is to come back to a situation where they had left, which is amongst the Muslim neighbors. So it's a very uh, difficult situation where uh, even if they were to return, the situation has not been created where they could. You keep talking about once it becomes normal and every Pandit family, whether those who are resident in Kashmir or the ones who have had to flee, they all believe that it was a very temporary phenomenon, two weeks, hmm. ten months, six months, and they would be back. And today it's 30 years. That is the biggest tragedy. And I think the government's duplicity comes out again and again. Yeah. On the one hand, you have crores of rupees packages starting from much earlier. 2008 was one of the big ones. After that, many more have been. So what has happened? Despite all that money, there is no way that the pundit wants to return. And you know what I found very moving? There are so many narratives and con you know conflicting things about how pundits left and how Jagmohan, the governor, then had helped them. But talk to anybody. Their honorable return, there is no second opinion, no divided opinion. Everyone would want them to return to where they belonged. You know, mm. Very few people sm spoke as such about Kashmiriyat. What they did speak about is how the values of secularism, the values yeah. of you know, the way they had lived always as two communities, but such close ties, you mm. know. So that is what they look forward to, that it should be that. But the more it's delayed, the more communalized, the more polarized, and there are right-wing organizations which are also trying to do that. Mm. And in the camps, it's a fertile ground, you know, to politicize the whole issue. So you demonize the Muslim community and you show the victimhood of the Pandit community. Their suffering, it has acquired a competitive edge. Who suffered more, the Muslims or the Kashmiris? 
you know, this is the worst that has happened. And talking about the women in Kashmir, so on the one hand, due to the extensive militarization, the uh, militancy, the growth of fundamentalist forces, and also the larger movement for self-determination, the uh, ideas of women's rights, the issues of women's rights, those have been sort of sidelined. Those have, there's no uh, as such space for them to be brought to the forefront anymore. Mm. But on the other hand, because of so many families losing their men to enforce disappearances and killings and torture and everything, women have been forced to occupy more central positions in family life and also in uh, Kashmiri struggles and movements. So where, how do you see this contradiction? I would again begin, go back to that uh, story of the pundits because, you know, when we talk about women, their victimhood or their agency or the fact that they have been so closely involved with the movement, yet the questions that are specific mm. to women's lives, whether it is uh, children, marriage, divorce, custody, those are issues known as, you know, what to do with women. So today, if they have not been central to the movement, there are reasons for it. And I used to find it a bit strange in the beginning, but I understood how in such a politicized, militarized terrain such as Kashmir, where your very survival is at stake, you know, it's an everyday battle to stay alive, to stay free of violence, to stay free of the threat of violence to yourself, to your women, to your family. And women acquire a very significant, you know, position and role in this whole thing where it has transformed dramatically. If you take Pandit women who left, you know, hmm. they may have been teachers, they may have been professionals, the conditions in which they left and the camp life. If you meet a woman who's lived in the camp along with her family raising children, in cramped conditions with public toilets, how does she n make that situation normal for the family? It's a struggle. Similarly, when you come to Kashmir, you will see that this kind of specific violence which women are targeted and the kind of violence that men face in terms of enforced disappearances, killing, the very fact that every man is a suspect in the eyes of the state agencies and the law. What happens in a situation like that? So, while many of the women, they're not too many in Kashmir, but say Muslim Khawatin markers, before that women's hmm. welfare society, then MK, uh, the other one, Dukhtarani Millat, it had all begun because particularly MKM and uh, Women's Wel uh, Welfare Society, WD, they had all begun with these questions. One, yeah. to deal with this kind of domestic violence or whatever may be happening inside the homes. Also, to protect the rights of women. But once the movement began and the whole atmosphere was charged with this whole question of self-determination and what the entire almost the entire population went through, you know, the tumultuous years and very turbulent period of the 90s, where uh, the figures are staggering. I mean, in these years, if you say 8,000 men have disappeared, this is just, I believe, a conservative estimate. Mm. It could be many more. You talk about 70, 80,000 people killed. These are staggering figures. And when you look at the men, uh, re records of the psychiatric hospital, it's even more shocking. At the start of militancy, there may have been 1,700 patients annually visiting the psych. Now, in the last two years, it has crossed 150,000 people who visit the mental hospital. It's an exponential growth. And it's really the doctors, the psychiatrists will say this is, at 20 years ago, I would hear that this is just the tip of the iceberg. And now with the changed situation where every Kashmiri is captive in his and her own home, where there is no communication, phones and whatever, the internet. So can you imagine the kind of added trauma to their lives and not being able to access the services that are already there? Today, mm. there's much better infrastructure for mental health services in Kashmir than when I had started work. There were two psychiatrists then. Today there are 50, more than 50, at district levels also. 
because you know on the one hand it tells you that services are improving on the other hand it shows you that the number of patients are increasing you know so where does it lead you hmm. that is a big question so that is why this collective trauma and this unresolved thing and the situation today particularly will carry on for generations. Children, I've met Kashmiris who have visited, they are saying we don't know what to do because children are so traumatized. They can't go to school, they can't go out to play, and they have no internet, they cannot. So it's really a very peculiar situation within families. So women's issues, if they're not being taken up in the manner, many people do believe that first thing you have to address in such a militarized, violent, situation is how do you keep yourself alive mm -hmm. and free from violence. All other issues, I think, because they, women coming out, you know, protesting, demanding accountability, seeking justice, that itself shows that it's not just about me as a woman and domestic violence. Yeah. There's that violence outside, which is targeting my children, which is targeting my husband, my brother disappearances. So that becomes one of the most fundamental issues for everybody, whether women or men. And also when we talk about sexual violence, for the longest time it has been very difficult for women to even bring it up, to even talk about that something happened to them. But now these things are changing. Now there are protests and rallies and movements mm. demanding justice, demanding accountability for sexual violence. So can you talk about this journey? Or that women have gone through to not, you know, sense of maybe shame or whatever they were experiencing before that they could not talk about it to now that they are demanding justice for it. And also the fact that the sexual violence has not just come from armed forces, it has also come from sometimes militants who women have uh, given shelter to, given, you know, f fed in the, and like kept them in their homes, mm. fed them at great risk to their own lives. Yeah, there are many different aspects to this whole thing. But yes, in any situation that obtains, such as in Kashmir, any other conflict situation, you would see that women are specifically targeted to teach the community, to threaten the mm. whole community, to punish them, to say, you do this and we do this to your women. So it's something that has always been happening. And here in the case of Kashmir, actually, yes, it is true. In the beginning, when I, 20 years ago, if I asked somebody, they would always say, no, these things don't happen, whether it's men or women would say, but too much has happened. You know, mm. silence can be maintained only up to a point, you know. After that, it is too difficult, too painful, too humiliating to remain silent, and that is what has happened in Kashmir. They are not just dealing with their own sexual violence, but also the sexual violence that men suffer from because once they are captured, once they are picked up, once they are taken away, there are many stories of how torture has become one of the most this yeah. thing. And in my interviews also men have spoken about how they have been tortured and how their bodies, women talk about how a man's body, her husband's would be brought and thrown in front of the house 20 times, 25 times, same man being taken and being brought back. And for women, you know, to bring that man back on his feet, whether it's a father, a husband, a brother. Children grow up watching all this. So I think this is something which is, what can you say? I mean, women are dealing with it. So today when they say accountability, justice, this is what they mean. What happens in homes where women are related to militants? Yeah. You know, their homes are marked. So the, that mujahid, that militant may not be inside the house, but women are marked by that. And they can be raided any time. And even if there is no militant in the house, there are other men, they are all pulled out. And once the soldiers are inside the house where only women are, you cannot imagine the kind of brutality that they can come to. And women mm. have suffered for that. And the question about security forces, very well known that these are the tactics they adopt and this is something they have used as a weapon to silence people or to bring them into saying stop this militancy and gun and we'll show you what we can do. 
But where militants are concerned, you know, to say militants also do it, one has to also understand that this whole 30 years, militancy has gone through different phases mm. also. There was a period when militancy was so popular and that whole image of the black bandana, the AK-47s, yeah. these tall men, and people used to, you know, really it had become such a popular, not just the image, but what they were doing, what they represented, the question of being azad, all mm -hmm. of that really, I think it was palpable and people really sort of used to open their homes. I've met people who said it was like a festival. Mil former militants that I met said that it was almost like we were great heroes, the way we were welcomed, the food mm. was good, kapde dho, dho ke, all kinds of things happen. So mm. there is an awareness and the women that I have interviewed, particularly the leaders, women leaders like Anjum Habib or Asyandra Abhi or anybody else or the former militants that you speak to, they acknowledge. One of the former militants told me that yes, we are also human, we have committed these mistakes but it's bound to happen in such a militarized thing where militants who have been subjected to torture, to uh, being abducted or... So they also adopt the same tactics where they believe that this is a government agent, this is an informer. So actually the whole perception of militants as heroes and validated as, you know, bringing in a certain political change, then this also happens. It's part of the reality where they feel disillusioned. What happened? But we have to remember that it's not a pervasive thing as it is from the security forces because they are the yeah. ones who have committed most atrocities. And when you talk about the women leaders, the names you just mentioned, you have profiled three leaders in particular, Bhaktawar, Anjum Habib and Asya Andrabi. And all three of them have led amazing movements, struggles for women and in general for mm. the self as part of the self-determination movement and they have been targeted relentlessly mm. by the state forces. So can you tell us why you chose these three in particular? Actually it's four women because one chapter focuses mainly on Parveena Ahangar. Mm. Yeah. So the interesting thing is Parveena's I've weaved into a complete story of her own because she epitomizes also many other women who have gone through it. Mm. So it's not only Parveena who, she was instrumental in mm. forming this whole association of parents of disappeared persons, the collective action, mm. how she brought other women together along with Parvez in rows of APDP when they established it. So one of the reasons I also concentrated on Parveena is an ordinary Kashmiri woman who mm. hadn't stepped out of her house, just as hundreds of other ordinary women who did not have to earlier. Yeah. But because of the conflict and the violence it generated, their first generation women workers that I've met, women whose roles have transformed completely. Parvina epitomizes how, and not only that, yes, today I'm traveling and I'm searching for justice, I'm asking for accountability. She's one of the angriest, at the same time, hmm. relentless struggle that she represents and other ordinary women also. So I decided that through her story, because I've met so many women from families of the disappeared, each one unique in their suffering because, you know, it's a common phenomenon where so many five, six hundred families, I mean, of members of APDP. So you can imagine if it's 8,000, it's lakhs of families yeah. and individuals that are affected by it. So Parvina, because of that, and it's interesting because Bhaktavar is her sister. And uh, she also started with Parvina a little bit, but before that with Anjum, hmm. when they first established the uh, women's welfare society, they used to call it, in which pandits, women also, 100 or 120 of them were pandit women members. So if there are 200, majority of them were pandit women also. Hmm. So from there to coming on, then militancy begins and then the pandits have left. So that becomes then Muslim Khawatin Markas. 
with the constitution, with everything. And Anjum's journey also, and Bhaktavar, who happens to be Parvina's sister. So how their lives were impacted, you know, this common thing of justice and for uh, redressing the community's, you know, problems that they were facing, particularly women. So they took up a lot of these issues together and formed this. So I wanted to see how their trajectory sometimes you know, converged, sometimes diverged during different times of the movement. So it's all nestled in the political context of Kashmir, but how each woman, woman looks at her own journey, how her own struggle. So that is why rather than have short stories or little references to a hmm. lot of women who are very instrumental in, you know, uh, contributing towards the movement. I just thought I would pick these three or four to show how they also represent a collective, yeah. you know. It was interesting for me to see how each one, and Asya and Rabi, none of these women use the word sacrifice or, you know, their suffering as much as pointing out to the state and what it has mm -hmm. done and how they were forced for personal reasons, political reasons, Asya and Rabi's story is different, Anjum's is very different, yet at the same time it tells you how each woman was pulled out of her comfort zone and how they grew into and evolved as very political beings and what their lives represent. As we speak, Asya and Rabi has been in jail for the last more than year in Rohini. She has spent most of her life in jails. The very fact that she had a small child once when, who's a grown up now, when she was picked up and imprisoned, that child was with her for 22 months, growing up inside the jail. Her defiance, her, you know, being ready. So whether you agree with her politics or not, whether you agree with her very, Islamic way of looking at things. So even if she talks about the movement, she will say if it trails off the Islamic path, it cannot be a success. Whereas Anjum is completely political, part of the Hurriyat Conference. Now she, from MKM, she has now come to call it uh, Kashmir Khawateen Markas, women's, hmm. Kashmiri women's movement, basically, because she also felt that while so many feminists or women come from outside, which is from India. We have our own story, we have our own struggle, and we yeah. have to bring it forward and show that this is also our voice, our struggle, our movement, which others can learn from. So these are three hmm. stories that I thought to reconstruct their lives so more readers get to know. And that was the reason, actually. Yeah. And uh, you talked about mental health care before and how there is a rising number of patients. So can you tell us more in detail about the sort of mental health care services that are there? Although you had mentioned that there has been a slight rise in number of uh, psychiatrists available, but there are still a lot of difficulties people have in accessing these services in both. You see, there is a lot of uh, stigma also where mm. you talk about mental health or many people, they wouldn't, for instance, when I visited the hospital and spent time, lot of time with doctors observing patients, you will see how conspicuous by their absence, young women, young boys, because yeah. they're particularly women, because it can jeopardize their prospects of marriage, people can raise their fingers, saying, okay. ye ladki pagal hai, whatever. So faith healers, to doctors, to neurologists, to anywhere. Psychiatric disease hospital is usually the last resort. When nothing helps, that is where they go to seek help. Yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, how women's roles have actually transformed so dramatically that a lot of women also as prime caregivers suffer doubly because mm. they are dealing with a missing man maybe, they are dealing with no livelihood, there are family where there is not a single male is left, it's all women. So these are first generation workers, whatever kind of employment you can find. These are female headed households which is all a new reality. 
you know, within which they are now negotiating their lives, the mm. women. So mental health becomes a huge issue and according to the doctors, it's not so much about medication. Mm. You see what is happening, the psychotropic drugs. I interviewed chemists also. Off the counter you can buy. And how do you deal with your prolonged depression? How do you deal with a child who wouldn't stop crying? How do you deal with a young adult who's throwing everything around? So the only thing you think of is give him medicines to calm him down. Parvina hunger. So many women that I've met who survive by popping these medicines. But mental health, one of the stress from doctors that I met at the institute is to say we counseling is more valuable than but there is no time, the number of patients compared to the number of psychiatrists, what are the health facilities, what is the kind of awareness, do you pop in tablets to get better or is there an atmosphere, an environment mm -hmm. where doctors can spend say half an hour with a young woman who's agitated, a woman who's come because her son refuses to talk or eat. So you don't immediately give them medication. Yeah. Doctors would pre counseling. Any psychiatrist would tell you this is what is required. And recently, 2018, when I last visited, I went to see Dr. Arshad. And when I went to see him, he took me around. There is actually visible improvement in the infrastructure. But when I entered where he had gone to sit that day, there were three, four other women psychiatrists helping him. You won't believe I saw the same number of patients queued outside. So on the one hand, the number of psychiatrists are increasing, but the number of patients, like I said earlier, and it is because of the specific situation of violence, uncertainty, hmm. political instability, repression, all of it is taking a toll. And it's very worrisome, you know, when we talk about intergenerally, today's young children, hmm. Can you imagine in the next five years, ten years? This trauma lodges itself. It's not something which is just, you know, it, it has physical uh, implications. Finally, in all your years in Kashmir, in all your experiences, all the conversations you've had with the people there, what do you think it is that the people need for a healing process to begin? What do people need? People need end to the kind of violence that has been inflicted upon them. People need to be free of the threat of that violence. People need to see that when they step out of the house, there is no soldier holding a gun to their head. People need normalcy is that which they require, peace. Non, you know, I'm not talking about non-violence in that sense, but how do you cope up day after day after day for 30 years? with the kind of violence that Kashmiris have faced. And most importantly, what they need is a political will from the government. What they need is for the government to acknowledge that too much has happened, too much violence, too much suffering, and we have to correct that situation. And how do you do it? By finding a political resolution to it, not sending more troops. There are thousands more now. No. That is not the solution at all. And now they've made it worse by snatching away whatever little they had. I mean, you dissolve a whole state into one union territory without a consultation. People are being jailed, sent out of Kashmir, PSA is being used against them. So it's, it's really a very, you know, I end my book on a hope, hmm. note of hope. But today when I see the situation, it's grimmer than what it was. It's worse than what it was. So that is really a tragedy, I do mm. believe. And what I've learned from them, you know, every act of defiance, it is just amazing that one could survive in a situation. We take a lot for granted, you know. I did. That I could step out anywhere, that I could speak, that I could meet people freely. And we take it for granted. But even for basic things, every Kashmiri has to struggle, yeah. you know, to speak, to go out, to be free. And everyone deserves that and their dignity. Absolutely. 
Thanks a lot, Seba, for Thank joining you, us Sivangil. today. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So this is all the time we have today in this interview. Thank you for watching News Click and the Indian Cultural Forum.